I will present you a joint work with uh, Philippe Carré, who is from uh, a Signal uh, Lab in Poitiers, uh, Céline Lacot, who is, who is uh, here, and Claire Launay, who, um, who was a, a postdoc in, uh, in my lab uh, at Tours, granted by uh, the INR project uh, MYSTIC, and MYSTIC is for Models Inference Synthesis for textures in color imaging. So I will briefly uh, describe what we are working uh, on. So um, what is uh, a color image? You have uh, here um, an example of wood texture from a database uh, of uh, color um, textures. So what is uh, this image? This is just a matrix of um, Pixels. So here we have uh, 2 to um, 9 times 2 to 9 pixels. But to get the color, you have actually uh, three channels. The or channels for the red light, green uh, denoted by G, and the blue channel, uh, this is um, the last one. So here, to get uh, this image, uh, you encoded each pixel by a value. Um, I'm sorry, it is not very uh, clear, but the, the, um, the color uh, map is here. So as um, the color is, um, is uh, close uh, to white, the value is uh, very high, and uh, the values of each channel are normalized to be in between 0 and 1. So this is a so-called RGB cube to, um, to encode uh, each pixel and to get this kind of color image. So you recognize uh, here a brown color. So this is at each pixel um, given by a subtle uh, mixing between the values in the channel. If you are not interested by color, in general, you, you are looking to um, images in a level of gray, and the level of gray is simply uh, obtained uh, by a linear combination, but with uh, not uniform weights on channels uh, to get the, the, the gray scale of uh, the image. So more precisely, um, you have um, here at each pixel a vector of R3, so what you, you can uh, consider is um, marginally statistics of the color image by considering um, separately the three channels. And here you have the distribution of the values for each channel. So you completely lose the spatial dependency with this uh, representation and you just see uh, the different value and the repartition of the value in each channel. This uh, um, may be um, used to define a kind of mean color. You just take the mean value of each, each channel, so, and then you combine it as a vector, and uh, you can display um, a constant uh, <coughs> color image that is given by the mean color of uh, the wood texture. So this is not, uh, this is quite as good as this image, but it is not uh, always the case. <laughs> um, more interesting um, is uh, when you draw the plots of um, the three values. This is uh, here my uh, RGB cube, and you have uh, here the, the values corresponding to each pixel of the image. So what you can see here is that uh, it, it doesn't fulfill the cube, so it is very thin in this part of the cube, and actually each channel are highly correlated. You can compute it uh, classically by uh, considering the correlation uh, between uh, the, the vectors uh, indexed by each values of pixels, and you see here this high correlation uh, between uh, each uh, pair. So in order to uh, model this um, 
high dependency between channels. Um, uh, Philippe Carré and uh, Raphael Soulard have uh, introduced uh, what they called uh, the color atom. And the idea behind this is that locally, uh, the color image is given by a color wave. What is a color wave? The color wave will be defined at each pixel as a result of okay, the, some uh, constant, mean value, and uh, actually, it will, uh, it will um, be given for each channel by this uh, formula. So what does it mean? It means here that um, the, the, um, the channels uh, behave uh, similarly at each pixel, and this is really important, actually, to get natural colors. So the way they are uh, um, dependently uh, um, correlated is uh, by the introduction of uh, some amplitude and a phase shift that um, correspond uh, to each channel. This is not uh, very uh, nice uh, to use it, but if uh, you consider complex number, you can see that actually the color wave is just to see that the image up to a constant vector is given by the real part of this function. And this function is, is just a wave with frequency given by W, and you play with it thanks to the color atom uh, that is given uh, with this formula. Okay, so now our work uh, considering uh, textures and more specifically micro textures will be to um, replace uh, this color, this uh, wave, by um, our favorite uh, random fields and uh, more specifically uh, self-similar random fields. So I will try to replace uh, this by a, a complex uh, valued center Gaussian random fields and uh, try to uh, mimic my texture and to extract the uh, principal um, characteristics. Okay, so what is the problem? The problem is that with my color at home, uh, I, I will uh, have to find this um, C3 vector and uh, what I will have at disposal is just my image that is real. This is a, that is real value. Okay, so I'm considering that uh, my image uh, has each channel to be real. So this is uh, given for one channel by this formula. And if uh, I um, consider um, complex valued uh, random field, I can decompose it with its modulus and uh, its arguments, uh, as it is classical uh, in, uh, for complex values. And uh, what is the effect of my fields on my atom? It's just that I um, multiply the amplitude by the modulus of my field, and I will uh, make a phase shift by the argument of my field, okay? And so, if I want uh, to synthesize an image that is uh, uh, with the same kind of color and texture as uh, an example, I will have to synthesize my uh, random field. So I, I will have to, to know how to do it, this. And uh, um, in order to make the link between the channels, uh, I, I need to uh, infer my color atom. Okay? But if I want uh, to be similar than an image, I just have access to the real part uh, of uh, the channel. So I just have access to this. Okay? So what we want is, for instance, um, we have this uh, wood texture. Uh, we want uh, to um, 
uh, simulate a fractional Brownian uh, field that is isotropic and self-similar. We know that its earth parameter H is linked with the roughness of the images, and we want to be able to um, get the same natural color in, uh, in, um, in our uh, roughness texture. So here you have three examples. Um, you see that uh, here H is, um, is greater than this one, so the, the roughness, uh, the, the images is smoother than uh, this one. And you can also play with anisotropy, that is an important uh, feature for uh, special um, images. And uh, so I will explain that later these uh, parameters, uh, and this is a kind of rotation of this one. Okay? So the main field uh, we will consider uh, will be in this talk, in this class of, um, of fields. Okay, so here is the outline of the rest of the talk. So in the first part, I will focus on uh, my texture. So now from now on, we are restrict ourselves to one channel. And we will uh, focus on how to define a complex, uh, uh, harmonizable, um, self-similar random fields. We will specialize on, um, on uh, some uh, typical uh, anisotropic uh, fields. And uh, after, in the second part, I will explain how um, we, we can infer from the real values of uh, the channels a kind of a, a complex uh, random field that will correspond to the real part of, uh, sorry, so that the image will correspond to the real part of, um, of the complex uh, field. And this is done through risk transform and monogenic uh, signal. Okay, so for the first part, sorry. For the first part, I'm sorry because uh, you probably already uh, hear about uh, this uh, kind uh, of uh, stuff, especially uh, in uh, Celine's talk. But um, there, there, there is some, um, some difficulties here between real value um, random variable, Gaussian random variable, and complex Gaussian random variable. So uh, I thought it was important uh, just to fix the ID. So I, I will begin, uh, I will consider actually harmonizable representation of uh, Gaussian fields. And to do this, uh, I need to introduce what is called the um, Gaussian random measure. So this one is a real Gaussian random measure. How is it, uh, how it is defined? Uh, I, I, actually, I will only consider the case of the Lebesgue measure denoted by lambda. And for each uh, subspace of R2 with a finite Lebesgue measure, I can associate um, Gaussian random variable, and uh, the Gaussian random measure is uh, corresponding to this uh, stochastic process that is indexed by some subspace of uh, the plane. And what I want is that when I consider one uh, value, this is a real Gaussian random variable, and the way the set acts on this uh, variable is just in the variance, okay? And everybody is centered. Uh, I have my mean uh, color, so now I forget, I forget um, the, the drift parameters. So this is the first, um, the first property. And to get uh, a kind of uh, measure, I need uh, to add this condition, that is, uh, if uh, my uh, set are disjoint, uh, I want to uh, get independence. And actually, uh, this comes from the non-correlated uh, of the non-correlation of Gaussian variable, because when you compute the intersection, the Lebesgue measure of the intersection of two and uh, two disjoint sets, this is zero. 
So you have a, a, a covariance that is zero between your two, uh, two variables. And since they are Gaussian, they are independent. And uh, to get the measure, you, you have this kind of uh, sigma additivity uh, uh, condition, but this is not uh, a real sigma additivity condition. And this measure, this Gaussian random measure, is not a measure. This is a stochastic process uh, that mimics the measure. But it mimics sufficiently to, uh, to perform a stochastic integral. And uh, in particular, uh, with this, you can take uh, a function that is the indicator of a nice set. Uh, you integrate it, and so you say, OK, this is m of a. Uh, I know this is Gaussian, blah, blah. You take uh, a linear combination, and you extend um, for each function that you can integrate uh, when you consider the variance. And considering the variance, the class of um, admissible function is uh, just L2. And here I have this uh, OR value because uh, I, I consider that F is a function with real value. Okay, So what I, I, I do is to a function with real value as I associate this stochastic integral. But what, what is it? It's it just a centered Gaussian variable with variance given by the L2 uh, norm 2, 2 of my function. This corresponds to an isometry. Since uh, if uh, I have a two function with real value in L2, if I consider This vector, this is a Gaussian vector. Oh, sorry. This is a Gaussian vector, and now um, its law is uh, completely de determined by its covariance function, covariance ma matrix here. And its covariance metric, uh, matrix is given by the variance here. And the integral between F1 and F2, okay? And so this is just the scalar product between F1 and F2. When I have uh, this uh, Gaussian vector, I can I identify it with a complex Gaussian vector just by considering this, uh, this value. And actually, this allows me to define the integral against my uh, real measure of a complex valued function. OK? And so the link is just that this Gaussian complex vector can be seen as a 2D real Gaussian um, vector. And now I can also extend my measure. And what is done uh, usually is to define a complex Gaussian measure just by saying, OK, now the complex Gaussian measure is given um, by this, uh, this complex uh, decomposition with two independent real Gaussian measures. OK, so now uh, you need to do a little of uh, computation. So I, I hope uh, there is no mistake. But uh, you can do it, uh, decomposing uh, with real part and uh, imaginary part. And uh, now you can define for G can be a complex valued function but it must be in L2 still. And you can define this, um, this uh, complex Gaussian variable that you can um, see as a vector. 
and this is a Gaussian vector uh, when you consider the real part and the imaginary part. And um, its law is just given actually by the identi identity matrix times the L2 norm of um, your initial function. So here it is a modulus of uh, G. Okay. So when you consider complex um, variable, complex uh, second order variable, there is actually two kinds of, um, of uh, covariance. The first one is uh, the so-called covariance that consists in computing the expectation of your complex variables times uh, um, the conjugate of another one. In our case, the way um, they are dependent is completely given by uh, the scalar product between G and J, J prime. And you have almost an isometry, but here you have this factor too uh, that makes some uh, trouble in computation. But uh, <laughs> you just have to remember that it is almost an isometry between my complex um, function of L2 and my uh, complex uh, random variables. This is not sufficient to characterize second order properties of complex variables. You need to uh, know what is called the pseudo covariance. And the pseudo covariance is uh, a, almost the same, but uh, you forget the conjugate. Here, in this uh, particular case, uh, it is uh, equal to zero, but the knowledge of these two uh, things allow actually to get the covariance matrix of the vector. And conversely, if you know this, you get uh, the covariance and the pseudo covariance just uh, by considering a combination of the coefficient. Okay? And now my functions uh, might be um, complex. So I have uh, all the ingredients <laughs> to define harmonizable representation of Gaussian fit. What is harmonizable? Well, we know how to integrate a uh, function, L2 function. Uh, uh, so uh, we can define a, a kind of uh, Fourier transform to get a complex um, stationary uh, Gaussian uh, field just by um, using our, our isometry and replacing uh, the function uh, g by g times this um, exponential. Okay? And so, uh, now what, uh, what will be uh, very important for second order properties is actually when you consider the um, scalar product of your function. So, I will just say uh, you have Jx that is given like this. And the same for x prime. So when you consider the scalar product, you recover the modulus of your function at each time. And this uh, square modulus uh, is called the spectral density of the field. This will be uh, the, um, the main uh, function that uh, will uh, give the dependence uh, property of uh, your stationary model. Okay, so we can introduce, uh, if I define this uh, as f, uh, I recognize the Fourier transform of my spectral density. Okay, so I will use it. Now, all my dependency depends on this Fourier transform. And when I consider uh, my vector as real part and imaginary part, what is important for the correlation of the real part is only the real part of the Fourier transform. 
So this is uh, my, my notation here. And uh, conversely, between real part and imaginary part, you just have the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. Okay, so now, what does it mean? It means that if I uh, switch G by G times E to I phi, okay, uh, my vector will have uh, the same second order properties, and so it will have the same look, finite dimensional distribution, okay? And this is, um, what we called isotropy for a two um, for for this complex variable. So if I specified to one pixel this equality, it means that actually uh, my uh, vector with real part and imaginary part has a distribution that is invariant uh, against rotation of uh, the plane. And so when you know that for a Gaussian vector, you immediately have the fact that its uh, argument is uniformly distributed on minus pi pi. And moreover, uh, you have independence between the modulus and the argument, and if you take the modulus to square, you uh, will have, with the convenient normalization, a key, de, uh, key to uh, the distribution. Okay, so that means that actually um, the phase, the phases of this uh, complex harmonizable uh, uh, field at each pixel are uniform. Moreover, uh, if you consider real and imaginary part of Z, uh, since uh, there are Gaussian with same covariance, they have the same law. And uh, this law is just the real part of uh, this Fourier transform, and it depends only on the distance between two points. So this is a so far stationary uh, property of harmonizable um, random fields. And in general, you, um, you play uh, first with the covariance of your real, um, of your real fields. And what you know, is uh, a nice uh, result from <coughs> Bortner uh, saying that, okay, if you have uh, a covariance function, this is a definite uh, positive uh, type function, and so this is the Fourier transform of a um, symmetric measure that is new. So every uh, covariance function with real value uh, may be given like this, but to get real value, you have to symmetrize your, uh, your, your, your measure, your spectral measure. So when you assume that this uh, measure is given, um, it, uh, admits a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so this is the so-called spectral density, and if uh, uh, you consider it as um, symmetric, F must be even. And if f is even, with real value, it means that the imaginary part here is equal to zero. Okay, so that's nice. With our complex uh, field, actually we have one real part, one imaginary part, they have the same law and they are independent. So we have independent copies. That's really nice uh, when you are doing uh, synthesis simulation. So you have two for uh, just one cost. Okay? But for our problem, uh, well, it, it, it implies uh, quite uh, some uh, difficulties. So this is not enough to, uh, to have stationarity property to define self-similar random fits. There is an obstruction here because um, when we want to, uh, to get uh, scaling properties, uh, we have to define uh, spectral density that are homogeneous function, to get homogeneous function for variance of fields. And you can't define an L2 function that is homogeneous. Okay? One way to do this 
is to relax a little uh, the stationary property. To do this, uh, we relax the L2 condition by just assuming that our function is integrable, L2 integrable, but now with respect to this uh, Levy measure. So you introduce, you, you allow a singularity around zero for uh, this function. And this is nice uh, because with this, uh, actually, if you switch uh, the parameter for the Fourier transform by uh, this parameter minus one, you um, get here, uh, thanks to this condition, a function that is in L2, and so you can define your uh, field. But you lose stationary. What you have now is what is called st uh, stationarity of increments. So this means that, okay, uh, I need to consider my increments, and uh, I will keep uh, the same, um, the same uh, property. So here, um, in general, we have minus x at zero, but the way uh, I have defined it uh, makes that z zero at zero is zero. Okay, so you can do that. X uh, still represents the real part of uh, this complex uh, stationary uh, harmonizable field, and we still uh, um, uh, say that uh, the, modulus, the square modulus of G is the spectral density, but now uh, it is an integrable function with respect to, to this. If we consider still the real part and imaginary part of uh, this new representation, we keep almost the same uh, property, and uh, we can uh, write at a pixel x this complex uh, field as its modulus time uh, this with a uniform phase independent from um, the amplitude. Oh, sorry, there is a zero here uh, that is needed. But since you have a, a non-stationary field, the expectation of the square modulus depends on uh, your um, position, x, your pixel. And um, this will play the role of the covariance function for stationary uh, increment fields. And this is the so-called variogram of, uh, of the real random fields. That is defined like this, and that completely uh, describes the properties of your real uh, Gaussian field. Just a remark, this is a, a well-known extension of stationary fields, uh, because if you can define uh, um, your stationary representation, so that just means that your function is actually integrable and does not have uh, this singularity at zero, you can, um, you can define the harmonizable uh, field, <coughs> and uh, z0 co just corresponds to z minus z0. So you just assume that there is a point uh, with a value zero uh, that is uh, required. Okay, so now I can define uh, self-similar fields uh, just by taking an homogeneous function for spectral density, and I, I, I just uh, have uh, to adapt uh, my parameter in order to, uh, to check my integrability assumption. This can be done by choosing uh, uh, this uh, way of uh, homogeneity uh, for h, the uh, so-called Earth parameter, between zero and one. But I am in dimension two, and so an homogeneous function is uh, a radial function times uh, an homogeneous function of degree zero. So this uh, t function only depends on the argument of the frequency, xi, and uh, will describe anisotropic property, properties of the field. We just assume that it is integrable and real value, and even since my spectral density uh, is uh, taken to be uh, even. And um, so for any function with this uh, property, you um, recover what is called the self-similarity uh, property. That means that if I consider my field at uh, another resolution, I think about uh, an image. 
So I would switch on, uh, the position x by lambda times x for a scaling factor uh, lambda. This uh, uh, field has the same distribution as this one up to the scaling factor that involves the Earth parameter. And uh, lots of things uh, are done uh, in this kind of uh, very well-known uh, self-similar uh, fields. Uh, in particular, H uh, completely describes the roughness of uh, the images. Since it appears as the critical order exponent, I think that Selin also presents you uh, more precise modulus of continuity involving uh, the H parameter. And uh, it corresponds to um, uh, an Osdorff dimension of the graph. So I, I, I let here uh, 0, uh, 1, the, the square, but it can be uh, any compact set. And what uh, we can also um, see is that uh, if you take a line in uh, an image of, um, of self-similar uh, fields, you will get uh, a fractional Brownian motion of parameter uh, h for each line up to, uh, to, re to, to um, remove the first value. Okay. And now, why uh, um, we introduce anisotropy is because if t, if the function is constant, since uh, the spectral density is radial, you have um, what is called an isotropy property of uh, the field. That means that if you rotate your image, you have the same distribution as uh, uh, your first uh, image. And in general, uh, this case is called fractional Brownian field. You can also... Uh, Céline told about motion, but uh, I make the... <laughs> distinction between the one dimension and the two dimension. So I'm considering field in two dimensions. So, okay. Uh, now we will focus on, uh, on a precise um, kind of uh, fields that is called elementary. And um, since uh, we have a, a nice uh, talk by uh, Yves Meyer, we have decided now to call lighthouse <laughs> field. Why? Because you can play with a very simple function that is supported by, um, by um, just a cone. So you take the indicator function of, um, of your cone. So here, my delta corresponds to uh, the opening, the angle opening of the cone. So I take my uh, radial uh, function, my spectral density, and then I uh, multiply with, um, with this indicator function. And that uh, allows uh, me to, um, to get an isotropy. I don't know where it is. Uh, maybe I can... La uh, lumière, okay. okay, merci. So here, when you consider uh, um, the function constant equal to one, this is the isotropic field. But when uh, you restrict the angle, you will see uh, an isotropy that is coming. We have um, proposed uh, uh, an algorithm to si synthesize uh, this kind of fields uh, with uh, Lionel Moison and uh, Frédéric Richard, and so we can use it and play uh, with different uh, parameters. Okay, I will uh, focus on this. So, we have the models. Now, we want to uh, extract parameters. Recalling that uh, we want to see our image as the real part of something. So, you have to identify, let's say, i of x as the real part of z of x. And you just want to say that this is an amplitude times a cosinus 
of something, okay? Uh, this is absolutely not uh, univoc. You can uh, define uh, any kind of uh, phi uh, and a when you observe this. The main idea is to uh, get back uh, to the um, analytic signal that say, okay, I will say my real signal as a real part of an analytic signal. And so you consider the analytic extension of uh, the real part of the, your signal on the upper space. In dimension two, um, in dimension one, you can do this with Hilbert transform. And this Hilbert transform may be uh, generalized with risk transform in dimension higher than two. So you are considering that what you are looking is a real part of analytic function, sorry, defined on the upper uh, space. Meaning that here, the value of uh, my phase function will be between zero and pi. Okay, so I just um, recall the definition of the risk transform. That is a very nice operator. <laughs> um, I just keep it, it, it uh, in dimension two since I'm considering images. And this is defined as a singular um, integral operator, uh, like this, but it is not very helpful. What we uh, really use is that it is a multiplier operator. And the multiplier operator is really nice. It is an homogeneous function of degree zero. Okay, this is a kind of a gradient. When uh, you consider the Fourier transform of your derivative, you just have i to uh, xi of k in the direction k. But since uh, you divide by uh, the norm, um, you will have uh, some uh, smoother properties. So it has a really, really nice property. Uh, since it is defined like this, when you take a real function, you will get a real function. Uh, using this, uh, it is quite easy uh, to, uh, to compute uh, things in the Fourier uh, domain. Um, it is uh, almost uh, self-adjoint, uh, but you have the minus uh, to take care of, and it has a, a, a what is called a conservation of energy. Um, that means that uh, when you take uh, twice uh, this operator, you have minus uh, the identity. And uh, from this, uh, it follows that it is translation invariant and scale invariant. Okay, so that is uh, really, really uh, nice for images. So in the sequel, I will note tau of x u, uh, this translation of my function, and I think I won't need um, the other thing. So now we want to define risk transform of our field, but uh, they are not uh, at all uh, very nice and uh, not uh, L2 function. But we can do this uh, using a uh, generalized uh, field uh, point of view. Uh, it, it, it is um, weaker than uh, what Vincent uh, told about, but this is the same idea. So just take a function and you test it and you, you are considering uh, the property of uh, the, um, the, the values uh, you are observing. So here, the good sp space of test function is a sh short space because we have a lot of uh, Fourier. And we restrict uh, to uh, uh, very nice function that have this moment uh, condition. So it needs to, um, to be zero when you integrate um, it. Okay, this, uh, this is um, necessary to uh, recover stationarity property when you consider um, fields with stationary increments. So now uh, I'm considering my uh, harmonizable uh, real part of random field. Recall that uh, my function uh, satisfies this, uh, this condition. And I will simply define uh, the value observed when I test against a nice function u uh, in this space. So uh, what I have uh, is a kind of uh, Fubini uh, theorem. And now I have, uh, I'm considering the real part 
of uh, this, uh, uh, this function. So this is my density. I, I chose it real so I can take the square root of it. And um, I, I just multiply by the Fourier transform now of, um, of my uh, test function. So previously I had uh, this uh, e to uh, minus uh, i uh, times x times xi. And now this is just my function, the Fourier transform of my function that plays this form. So uh, this is a Gaussian centered variable. And now the variance is the spectral density uh, times the modulus uh, square of my, uh, my test function. And I can do this also for the risk transform, because using the duality, uh, it is uh, just uh, uh, necessary to uh, replace u by this. OK, this is not a tempered uh, function, but I, I don't need it, actually, to define this. And what I, I am doing is uh, just recalling this minus. I take uh, the uh, minus of the risk transform of my function. And now I have modulated my variances with this argument. And we remark that the conservation of energy is given by the fact that the <coughs> variance uh, between the sum of the variance in the direction are equal to the variance of the initial signal. OK. When we have this nice uh, formula, we can define what is called the monogenic random field. What it is, it is just uh, the um, value of x against a test function. And you add uh, the risk transform that it is a two-dimensional uh, value. So here, you have a three-dimensional uh, random field indexed by now a function, u, nice function. But uh, you can recover your favorite uh, stationary Gaussian fields just by saying, OK, my pixel, I have a, a, a smoothing effect, a filter. And then I, I'm considering the values on um, the translated points of this initial filter. OK, so now I'm just with something a random function that is indexed by R2, but now with value in R3, OK? And so to characterize its <laughs> behavior, since everything is Gaussian stationary, <coughs> uh, I need a covariance uh, matrix that is uh, completely given by this formula. So here it is uh, the Fourier transform. So this is because I'm considering uh, the point x uh, and uh, u. And uh, I have this, uh, this matrix. So when you consider x equal to 0, you just have uh, the covariance of um, one point in my RGB cube, remember? So you have just the distribution of uh, this monogenic uh, signal. And so you, you don't have uh, here this Fourier transform. So this is very nice because we can also uh, obtain a multi-scale representation just by uh, playing with uh, our test function and adapt the scale with it. OK, so I we got. Uh, so um, what we have done is to, uh, to consider the distribution of one uh, uh, single um, value in our north three and especially for um, our favorite lighthouse fields. So I have this parameter delta, my parameter h for, uh, to govern the roughness. And now what I am able to say is that at each point, so just uh, marginally, my monogenic signal is almost um, uh, um, a transformation of a Gaussian vector in R3, a standard Gaussian vector in R3 with uh, um, a variance uh, that is given by the initial variance. And the deformation of combination is given by this matrix. And this matrix uh, uh, will uh, only depend on what is called the currency index of the field. For 
elementary or lighthouse fields. Uh, this is only given by the uh, sinus cardinal of, uh, of this. Okay, and uh, so if you consider jointly with pixel X, you have stationarity, and now you have this kind of scale invariance property also for um, when you, you change the scale. So now you have um, some monogenic parameters uh, that, uh, that, um, that are described using the fact that you have an R3 valued uh, field. And when you have a point in R3, you can use spherical coordinates. This is the mean of this parameter. So you use spherical parameter to a spherical coordinate to <coughs> define monogenic parameters with an amplitude that is just the uh, norm of the monogenic uh, signal, a phase function that will uh, um, allow us to define this, and an orientation that is uh, completely uh, given by the risk transform and that will characterize anisotropy. A little late, sorry. Um, no, what we know about uh, spherical coordinates is that um, we have uh, this uh, stationary property because the initial field is uh, stationary. This uh, um, change of uh, scale will act only on the amplitude because fa phases and orientation uh, won't uh, see uh, the change of scale. And uh, we are able to compute uh, the distribution of the orientation. And the orientation clearly depends on uh, the coherency index that is still given by the um, uh, opening angle of uh, our lighthouse field. We can do <coughs> more in the isotropic case and uh, it is not surprising to say that in the isotropic case, recalling that uh, delta is given by this, the coherency is equal to zero, and so your orientation is just <coughs> uniform. This is a, a uniform uh, distribution. And we uh, are able to um, compute the distribution of the phases. Why is it nice? It is nice because we can uh, consider algorithm and um, <laughs> test if it if it's uh, if it is correct. So here you have uh, for h equal to 0 0.5. Uh, this is the isotropic case. So we have computed in red the uh, real uh, theoretical distribution. You have your field, your filtered field, corresponding to x time. Uh, x again u, and the computed risk transform in the two directions. So from this matrix of pixels, we have uh, histograms. So we consider the monogenic, and then we compute amplitude, um, orientation, and phases. And this corresponds to uh, our theoretical uh, value. Now, playing with uh, anisotropy, you see uh, that it will act uh, on the way um, the orientation is distributed. So that's a, a very good uh, feature to detect um, anisotropy in the image. Uh, no, la, uh, no, here, this is um, the previous uh, phase, but we will see that it will not be the good one in the anisotropic situation. Okay, and just to, uh, to, to conclude, it was not um, very surprising, this results, so, because it was already observed uh, by uh, Sofia Oledo and Kevin Polizano, uh, that um, to, to characterize anisotropy, one can use just the, um, the risk st structure tensor. And the risk structure tensor just corresponds to <coughs> the uh, covariance matrix of the risk part. And it will only 
uh, depend on uh, the, the anisotropy will only depend on the coherence index uh, that is given by this ratio. And this is usually uh, used when you are considering a tensor to estimate uh, some quantities. For our case, this is um, the lighthouse. So I will skip it. Uh, we can do some statistics, give some uh, normality results. Uh, there are some uh, nice uh, stuff. Huh? And when you play with your codes, uh, you say, OK, it works uh, pretty well. Here, this is an uh, estimation. For H, this is the coherent uh, uh, we want to have. And we see that, OK, the first, the first scale here is not very good, but um, <coughs> Well, it works between uh, the scales two and three. Here, uh, you have the scale three. So you say, oh, OK, it is pretty well to estimate the coherence. Here, we have h uh, between this value, uh, between uh, 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. But for h um, near than 1 or uh, 0, uh, it won't behave uh, very well. And you can also play uh, to estimate um, the Earth parameter using scaling property. So I will just conclude, sorry, and we'll be late. So we have, um, with this monogenic approach, uh, we have defined uh, a very uh, new uh, estimators that, uh, that are performant based on uh, retransform and uh, and um, monogenic parameters. Uh, this allows us to uh, test the algorithm. And um, we have some difficulties now for um, some scale um, that are not adapted. So we are planning to, uh, to develop uh, this uh, inference um, an analysis. Um, and in particular, coming back to our initial problem, we will need to define, so we can extract this. This is an angle. And so if we want to estimate the color atom, we will need to define a kind of mean angle that is not uh, really uh, well defined. <laughs> if you think about a uniform distribution, what is the mean? I don't know. And um, we want also uh, so um, uh, do this uh, kind of job. We have a postdoc position available, so do not hesitate uh, if you know uh, some candidate. And I thank you for your attention. I have one question. You, you, you motivated the, the study. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. You motivated the, the, the study by these uh, wood textures. So I was wondering if you, if you tested the algorithm on these uh, textures and uh, if it allows to do some classification. or. Uh we would like, yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, uh, w definitively, we would mm. like to use uh, the color atom mm. in order to make some uh, classification. Mm -hmm between image. But uh, this is really um, linked with the color content. Yes. And uh, so here, uh, for wood, uh, I have, um, well, I have an image that, that, do, that does not uh, oscillate too much from uh, yes, its it mean. Yes, it looks almost uh, yeah. monocolor. And so, yeah. so, so it works. But uh, when you have a richer content mm -hmm. for color, it is uh, much more difficult. But um, Raphael uh, Soulard and Philippe Carré, uh, Carré have um, defined what is called an elliptical model okay. to encode all this stuff. <coughs> and uh, we would like to go further mm. uh, in, this, uh, in this model uh, to discriminate and to classify okay. uh, color uh, textures. Yeah. Very good. No but other question? We are just... Uh, well, in that case, thank you again. Thank you.